in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. Help, me let the right in, help me let the right things in and keep the wrong things, out. Keep the wrong things Come out. Come on, give him a praise clap in this house if you believe that. Let's read it again. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. Now join hands with somebody. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, let that scripture come alive in our life. Let it be the anointing and the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now as you're sitting down, look at somebody and say, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Just tell them that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Now our foundation scripture has been with the armor of God. Everybody say the armor of God. I have it up here as a depiction so you can physically feel and know. Today we're going to talk about the shoes of peace. The sandals of peace. How many of you know peace is not an easy thing to get? In fact in a confused doubting world that is full of confusion the world is looking for peace but how many of you know they're looking in all the wrong places? They're looking in financial security, or they're looking in what their possessions are, or maybe they're even looking in drugs or alcohol to find peace. But how many of you know those things are not what I'm talking about this morning? You will never find peace in this world in natural means. The only way we can ever find peace, and the only way we can ever put the shoes of peace on, is to know the power of God, and know that the Spirit is working in our behalf. Amen. And when we do that, certain things begin to be released into our life. And even though there are circumstances there, how many of you know you can walk through a storm but still be in peace? Amen. Amen. And because we know that and the world cannot do that, how many of you know the world needs to look to us to really find the meaning of peace? Because they will never find peace in all the natural things of this world. Only God can bring true peace. And so, let me go back and reiterate. It says in Ephesians 6, Therefore take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Does anybody question we live in an evil day? Oh, yes. We live in a confusion. It's, it's almost like up is down and down is up. It doesn't, it's almost like things have just switched gears in some way. I'm not really sure what's happening other than I know one thing. God will have a church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No matter how dark the world is, the light of Jesus can shine greater. Yes. And so we don't have to get too worried about this evilness. What we need to do is focus on Christ and what he wants from us in our lives. Then he goes on to say, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Everybody say, stand up. Stand up. How many of you know it takes a real character, a real perseverance to be able to stand up sometimes? Because how many of you know it's not always possible, it's not always, if you will, popular to stand for what is right today. And I love you, and I know the youth just left, but it's the truth. How many of you know that it doesn't mean God cares about how we dress, or how we look, or how high we can pile our hair, or how low we can get our hemline, or how many white shirts we own. And all of those things for years was basically if you will, spiritual. If you wore those things, you were spiritual. But I do believe there's a way to dress. I do believe there's a way to talk. I do believe there's a way to think. I do believe that we need some standards in our life that the Holy Book brings out to us. So when I do that, we don't need to throw the whole thing out. I firmly agree that God is not into religion, he's into relationship. And I really know the power of relationship isn't what was on the outside, it's what's on the inside that matters. But at the same time, how many of you would agree that this exterior makes a little difference? Come on, church. And so I only say that because if we're going to stand for what is right, it isn't always going to be popular to tell people that they don't need to wear things sometimes that they do wear. How many of you know a woman doesn't need to show everything she has to be a woman? Thank you for that amen. 
How many of you? It isn't how many cuss words you know that really makes you a man. It's how many cuss words you don't use when cuss words fit and they often run through your mind like they do mine, but that doesn't mean they have to fall out your mouth. Come on, church, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. Because I, I believe that the exterior doesn't have a lot to do with Christianity, but I do believe there's things we need in the exterior and to renew our mind and to really walk in the spirit to prepare ourselves for that. And that's what he's talking about. When you've done all, stand. Look at your neighbor and say, I have to do some things. Just say that. And really what we don't understand is the anointing of God sometimes our have to's become our want to's because we love God. That's right. Amen. And it isn't like God put so many rules and regulations or religion. God has really allowed us to be free, but there are some standards I think that we need to live by. Amen. Amen. And then it goes on to say, having girdled your waist with truth. Everybody say truth. truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. And then, this is the power that we really are going to talk about today. And having shod your feet with peace, everybody say the preparation of peace. Preparation. Now what this means, in fact, you can see the breastplate of righteousness. We talked uh, last week about what righteousness does and what the power of that righteousness does. We don't stand in our own righteousness, we stand in the righteousness of God. We're not in right standing with God because we're so great or we're so popular, or we're so good-looking, like me. I wanted an amen there. No, I'm just... <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for letting me just have a good time up here. Um, you know, church would be the greatest time of the week. It always is for me. I'm going to be transparent with you. But my righteousness doesn't stand in what I am, or what I look like, or what I feel like. It stands because Jesus rose from the dead for me. Yes. And he rose from the dead for you. Yes. And that's what makes me righteous. Yes. Not because of what I am exteriorly. In fact, it's so sad because really what I want to talk about now this morning is, is about the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everybody say the gospel of peace. Gospel of peace. How many of you know if we're going to walk in this, the Roman shoulder soldier had shoes, but... He had to prepare to put them on. Everybody say preparation. preparation. In other words, really, if you don't lace the shoes up, how many of you know they don't work in the way they should? Because the way these shoes were, they slipped over the toe and the heel with straps in between, and then they were laced up along the calf and tied at the top. And how they were fixed on, how many of you know every soldier learned how to lace those up that would help them in battle? Because if those were loose or out of place or wouldn't fit right or weren't tight enough, how many of you know you don't want to slip if you're in the middle of a battle? That's right. And so there's a preparation that takes place. If you're going to have peace, you're going to have to prepare to have peace. It doesn't just come naturally. Peace is not something you just get because you know God. You have to prepare to say, whatever happens to me today, I'm going to walk in peace, irregardless of what the enemy tries to come against me. Every morning when I get up, I said last week, and it's true, I say, whatever comes into my life, I'm going to walk in the peace of God no matter what it is. Because if you don't prepare for it, that's why it says, and it's funny, this, nothing else in the armor says to prepare. You just put it on. But the shoes, it says to prepare for the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, if you don't prepare to walk out the word of God, if you don't prepare to do the things the word of God says, how many of you know then you probably in that day something will come your way. Well, you'll forget about the word of God. You'll forget about the peace of God. You'll forget about the truth of God. And when we do that, then we begin to walk in the flesh again. And even though we're saved, we don't change. How many of you know God came into your life not to leave you where you are, but to take you where you need to be? Amen. And none of us are perfect. In fact, everybody used to say, I'm not where I used to be. I'm not always where I want to be. But I'm on my way. Come on, give the Lord a praise clap in here if you believe that. We're not perfect, but man, we can be moving toward what God wants for our life constantly. And this is where the shoes come in, so we don't slip and lose the ground that we've taken. When you've taken ground, anytime in any military action, any soldier, any private can tell you that you never want to pay for the same ground twice. Yeah. 
Why lose and go through all you have to go through to take the ground you take and then give it back to the enemy and have to take it again? Amen. Come on, church, are you out there? Amen. And so we need to understand that this is what happens. So when we walk in the gospel, everybody say gospel. gospel. How many of you know the gospel is good news? Good news. Everybody say good news. good news. Come on, put a smile on your face. Say good news. Good news. Look at your neighbor and say good news is coming into my life. Just tell them that right now. Hallelujah. That means the power of good news. The gospel of peace is good news. When we've prepared, there's good news on our way. When we've laced our shoes up, when we've got ready and putting the whole armor of God on, we can find the peace of God that surpasses all understanding only by being prepared, but to realize there's good things going to happen. There is such a pessimistic mindset today in our world. Well, I want to tell you right now, we do not have to fear what is happening in this natural world. I don't know about you, but sometimes heaven looks, I think we're really closer to the end than we are at the beginning, first of all. I don't know if the Lord will come back in my time, but I know one thing. If he does, I want to be standing next to sinners so I can grab two of them. When I'm 100 feet off the ground, I can say, do you want to know Jesus? I don't want to be in church. I want to be out there in the world helping people and ministering to people because we have the good news. Yes. How many of you know you don't get good news listening to 6 o'clock news? No. 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 Come on, let me get an amen there. Amen. I mean, it seems like bad news sells. Well, what does that tell us? Humanity feeds on bad news, not good news. Amen. Or they would be putting good news out there because they've done polls, statistics, surveys. They've done all these things to know that people will click the thing on to bad news. How many of you know when the weather comes on? You know, the only thing I watch on the news, literally, is true. It comes on at 6.15, 5.15. No matter what I'm watching, I flip over to see the weather. But when the weather's over, I flip back to what I was watching. Because I refuse to let the course, I want to be informed, don't misunderstand me. I know we're in an election year and I want to know things. But look, you don't need to know about every problem in the world. That's right. How many of you, if, if you will, you know, some of the greatest things, now we didn't have a lot in my family when I grew up, but one thing we did had, we ate around the table. And back then, you know, we, a lot of times we would watch the news, but how many of you know there was only three channels? Yes. You didn't have a flipper. You had to get up and go turn the channel. Click, 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 click. I know I'm dating myself, but, and really, there was electricity when I was born. <laughs> but, you know, things have changed a little, haven't they? Yes. I mean, it's amazing. We have something like, probably 10 to 12 channels that are 24-7 news when the only news you ever got in any given day was from 6 to 7 when I was a kid. That's it. You didn't get news all day long. We, I think sometimes we're too informed because bad news can take good news out of your life. Amen. Come on church, are you out there? It's time we recognize that we don't we we can't filter if we're watching that all the time. Our brain can't filter all of that out. And so therefore we can't walk in the peace of God because we're so full of negativeness and that's exactly what the enemy wants in our life when we're fighting this battle. He wants to see the things that are happening that are bad. How many of you know that there's a lot of good things happening too? Amen. And how many of you know you've got to study sometimes to show yourself approved? You've got to look for those things. And how many of you know this is the greatest news? It is good news to those that know it. And those that will read it. And those that will live it. It's the power and the anointing. So we need to understand and have that power that we serve a God of good news. Everybody say good news. Good news. So gospel means good news, the truth of the word of God, the grace of God, the gospel of salvation, and true teaching. Everybody say true teaching. true teaching. Not everything we hear is all true teaching. I'm not here to, what I'm here to do is to sow into your life and plant into your life the best I can with truth. Because the girdle of truth is what holds all this armor together. Without it, we really have no guidance system in our life spiritually. But with truth, all things are revealed to us. Truth makes us free. 
America is a great place to live. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world. I've served in our military. I serve and pray for our country constantly. I've done other things. But I want to tell you, my country doesn't make me free. God makes me free. Amen. And when you know that freedom, there is a difference. There's a power. So we need to understand it's good news. We also need to understand that that out of that good news, we have the answers, we have the truth to what the world needs. Amen. Now let me tell you, the world doesn't know this. Robert shared a little bit about it when he was getting ready for communion, but our world needs to see some people that walk in good news and peace because they're not getting much of it. Hello? Come on. And so if we are that, if we are that answer, if the God, the amazing part to me is God will always have a church. But what I see is I see a lot of fear today in America of where we're going. And listen, I think you need to be so concerned, but God has not given you a spirit of fear. That's right. You should not fear, because God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He will always have a people. He will always have a place for us to meet. He will always, even if we have to do it underground, I want to tell you now, God will always take care of his church. Yes. And you're part of that church. You have that anointing to fellowship in that. So we need to take full advantage of that. Amen? Amen. And so truth is what we need to understand. We also need to understand the, the, the power and gospel of grace. Everybody say, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Even when I don't feel like it. You know, none of you will be good enough, but you can have grace. You can have unmerited favor. You can have that love that God has for you. That how many of you know, we love so much out of the circumstance of feelings and out of actually, if you will, uh, compensation. I mean, we live at a, where if you do what I like, I like you. The moment you stop doing what I like, I dislike you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, how many of you know that's not love? How many of your kids have ever disappointed you? <laughs> Nobody that's here in my kids, but... <laughs> Shelly's never disappointed me. Well, maybe there was one time. <laughs> but the real power of that is, did I stop loving my kids because they disappointed me? Well, we don't understand. That's how God is with us. That's what grace is all about. We might miss it, but how many of you know, praise God, for good news of grace? Mm -hmm. Amen. The gospel is full of grace. And then lastly, the word is peace. Now, here's where we left off. Peace is a state of security to know God, the, to know the God of peace, and to be in harmony. How many of you know I said, and this is where we stopped, but I want to speak this into your life again quickly. Um, a person that's insecure can't know peace. If a person doesn't like who they are, and that's where a lot of, if you will, people fall into the trap. <laughs> well, yes, Lord. I'm going to say this. Uh, I'm preparing actually a message on hurting people hurt people. Oh, yes. Amen. And a lot of people don't really understand that when you're hurt, what's happened to you is somebody has hurt you and so you're insecure with that and you won't open yourself up not even a lot of times to God and yet it's an amazing thing because how many of you know that's a trap in your life Amen. not just, just sort of that is a trap to have unforgiveness or to not forgive the way the Bible explains that is like this has anybody ever trapped animals in here or been around animals where they have been trapped? Okay. Do you know the little spot in the middle where they put the bait? That is what sets the trap off. The trap works on its own, but the, the creature has to touch the bait. Unforgiveness is the bait of the enemy. Amen. It is a trap that you reach your hand into and when you touch that the trap goes off and it has you now under its control you are no longer under your control you're under the control of the trap 
you stuck your hand into. Amen. And literally, if you look in the Old Testament, to, uh, to dislodge people or to maim people, even in the New Testament, I believe the enemy uses that trap of unforgiveness. And it's the bait to where you now cannot function in the way God wants you to function and have the peace of God because now you've reached your hand in the trap. Come on, church, are you out there? Yes. I mean, uh, does anybody know how they catch monkeys in Africa? Yes. Yeah, let me tell you the story. If you want to catch a lot of them, you use nets. But if you want to catch them one at a time, all you do is you put a banana or an orange or something in a jar, a glass jar, stake that jar out, and the monkey will reach in there and it will grab that piece of fruit and it will not let go no matter what. Even if a man is walking over there with a club to kill that animal, he won't let go of the fruit to just reach his hand back out. If he would let go of the fruit, his hand would fit right back out the jar. But with him having the fruit in his hand, he can't pull it out. And he'll stand there and do this and a man can just walk over and crush his head. You talk about a trap. How many people in life have reached their hand and they won't let go? Even though the enemy is there to bash your life to pieces. I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. amen. Because, see, this is where we live. This is why the gospel has to be good news. You can't get into the trap and try to find peace if you don't see the peace of God that presses. What is it? You know what? It's amazing. That scripture says, um, lean not on your own understanding. Believe in God. You also believe in me. Later on, Jesus gives to Paul these words. He says this. He says, peace that passes all understanding. Do you know what the very next scripture is? Casting all your cares on me. Amen. So good. Do you think that's just by chance? No. Nope. That's the real power of God. You've got to let go of some things to really know the peace of God. And if you're insecure within yourself or you have a victim's mindset, you will hang on to those things all your life. And you're like the monkey. You won't let go so God can get your hand out of the jar and you are peaceful and free once again because you're hanging on to something that you cannot let go of. This is why you can never live in the past. Paul said in Philippians, I forget those things which are behind and I reach. What did he mean? He had to empty his hands of what the, what the past was doing to him. Now this man was beaten, thrown in prison, stoned, snake bit. And this man said, I don't live back there. Amen. How many of you know maybe he had a right to feel a little sorry for himself? Look at your neighbor say, cry a river, build a bridge, and get over it. Just tell him that. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know my therapy is not the best in the world. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to get past some things, church. If you're ever going to really know freedom, if you're ever going to really know peace, because peace doesn't come from a circumstance of the world. It comes by the Spirit. And if we have our hands hanging on to something that's bothered, we can't fill our hands with the peace and gospel and good news of God. Amen. We just can't do it. It's impossible. You can't fill your hands with two different things. Yes. Let, James says, let this man that is double-minded, let him realize he will receive nothing. You can't be double-minded. Peace is what God wants for you. One of his names is peace. Yes. Shalom. When people say shalom in the Jewish land, that means peace to you. That means the power of peace. It's about time we need some shalom in America. Amen? Amen? And so we have to be secure. And if we're insecure, we'll never get there. How many of you know you only know this peace through God? You can't find it in circumstances or people or, oh, they complete me. Oh, I'm alone. I need somebody. Well, what about God? 
Right. I'm not saying God doesn't want someone for you, but if he can't be first, he's not going to give you somebody else to be first. Because I, I, I hate to say this, but God doesn't take second place in anybody's life. He's either Lord of all or Lord of nothing. There's nothing in between. I hate to be so blunt, but it's true. He's got to be the number one. And I mean, I've told the story, but it's so true. Pastor Sandy, when we were dating, you know, I was 16 at the time. And she was telling me she loved this invisible God more than she loved me. And I'm like, what? How can you love God more than me? And I would whine about it. And... I mean, look at this thing, you know. <laughs> you go, boy. Come on, church. Are you out there? I mean, you know, we got to really understand who we live, where we live. But listen, God is number one. If I've learned anything in my spiritual walk with God now, I've learned that God does not. Pastor Sandy, as much as I love her, we celebrate an anniversary in a month. 46 years of marriage, three years we dated before that. But I know God has to come first in both our lives. Because she can't complete me without God. And people that don't make God the center of their relationship, they're missing out. They're really missing out of the peace of God. Because what the enemy wants, he wants to take that peace from your home. Not just from you, but you, you can't live with a person that can't live in peace. If you know peace, it is contrary. They're the two opposites. Negativity and peacefulness are the two opposites. And those opposites cannot be one. You have to let go of one or let go of the other. But we make a choice. Come on, church. So knowing God, look at this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you have peace? Through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. I'm sorry. Some people say, well, boy, you guys preach Jesus and he's the only way. Isn't that a little narrow-minded? And I love what Rick Warren said on Larry King. I heard it years ago and I've never forgot it. He said, well, Larry, let me ask you this. If somebody was standing in an airline on the ground that was burning and a stewardess shined the light down the smoky uh, residential place and said, this is the only door, would you call that narrow-minded? Right. <laughs> Hello? That's right. I want to tell you, all roads don't lead to peace. Only one road leads to peace. He named him here, Jesus Christ. Amen. And him alone can bring peace into our life. Yes. All roads don't lead to God. And I don't want to get to the end of the ladder and find out my ladder is leaning on the wrong wall. Come on, church. Okay. So we need to understand where peace really comes from. And then lastly, I'm going to close with this. Um, the other word for peace is harmony. It means, it's a form, it's actually a, a root word of unity. It's one of the words of unity. Can I tell you the enemy is trying to destroy the home today? Yes. And one of the ways he uses it is with confusion, selfishness, yes. Amen. and not being united. Because see, a home united cannot stand. The word says that a home that is not united will not be able to stand. Right. But a home united cannot be destroyed. Amen. Now, one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of peace in the marriages and in situations today is because the people don't live in harmony. You know, the unique thing about the Roman soldier, which was what Paul gave us in Ephesians with this armor, the unique thing a lot of people don't understand is this shield is not just a shield, and we'll be talking about this next week, it's not just a shield to cover this man, but they also can connect to one another and cover each other. It's a form of harmony is what he's really talking about. Plus, what's amazing is people don't realize that to be a Roman soldier of a legion, you had to go through a boot camp for six years. It took them six years to train a legion of troops. 
Why? So they would all move together. They would all know. The two things that made Roman powerful was because they could build roads. And number one, their army fought as one man. How many of you know that's what we're supposed to be doing in the body of Christ? But that's also what we're supposed to be doing in our home. Homes are not supposed to be divided. They're supposed to be united. Now, I know this isn't a marriage seminar, but you need to understand that that's the one thing God set up before anything else when he made Adam and Eve. And he set up a home life, a, a family life, family. And so the one thing the enemy attacks the hardest isn't even the church, it's the family. Yes. It's a relationship with a man and a woman. It's the kids. Come on, church. Because what happens is if he can divide the family, he can win in society. But if the family stands, and I don't have to tell you, there is a battle today against the family. Yes. Come on. Against the married unit between a man and a woman, there is a huge battle today that I don't have to tell you is very structured and very surreal in our society that the enemy wants to kill the family. Yes. Because if he can kill the family, he's got us in his trap. And we won't let go of this because we want our own way more than we want the relationship. Amen. Now, I know i got to shut this down, but harmony is so... Look at it. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ. So where does a lot of this start from? In the mind and in the heart. Amen. And as the heart is, the mouth speaks... And as the heart becomes, the mind will begin. So what's happening? We're letting things in through our eye gates and our ear gates. You have two gates in your life. One is your eye gates. I'll do a series on this next year. Uh, your eye gates, what you look at is what you desire. The thing you look at the most, if you love God, you look at the Word of God more than anything else. Amen. So good. Or you hear sermons. You... Listen to me. I love you. But you need to listen to Christian music and quit listening to secular music. Because, I mean, I don't know about you. I was a kicker when I, before I was saved at 27, you know, I called myself a drugstore cowboy. I had the $150 beaver hat. You know, I had the great cowboy boots. I'm not opposed to that. But I'm going to even know a lot of kicker music surely doesn't edify the marriage. <laughs> Lucille left me. I kicked my dog. I rode my truck. Everybody gets looking better at closing time. Come on, church, I know those songs. You think I'm stupid? I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I mean, you've got to understand what the enemy is doing. You've got to know his tricks. And harmony is one of the things he fights the most because it brings peace. It's part of the definition of peace. And when there's not harmony and there's confusion, he has the right to traffic in that. And gates are very important to God. You have eye, everybody say, my eye gates and my ear gates. Those are gates. And let me tell you how important gates are. I don't have time to preach all this, but it's important you understand that. It says, I will build my church, and what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, what does he mean by that? This is what he means, the same with our eyes and our ears. What he literally means is gates are where things go out or come in, or you shut them out, come on. and they can't come in. Amen. Those are heavenly things. There are gates in heaven, literally. Yes. The pearly gates, anybody ever hear of that? Yes. Gates are important to God. And our eye gates and our ear gates let things in or we keep them out. Yes. Amen. And it, just like it says, the gates of hell will not prevail yes. against my church. He wasn't talking about those gates coming and prevailing. He was talking about things he won't let in and things he won't let out. Praise God. We need to understand we let certain things in and we let certain things out with gates. We open the gates to certain things and we close the gates to other things. Come on, church. Come on. Amen. 
And so, I'm about ready to wrap this up. Give me a minute here. But we have to understand how important gates are. Because if we don't understand gates, we can't understand peace. And so everybody say, my choices are gates. I either let things in or I keep things out. In the name of Jesus, help me let the right things in and keep the wrong things out. Come on, give him a praise clap in this house if you believe that. So we're going to pick up here next week. We're also going to be talking about the, the anointing and shield of faith. How many of you know the shield of faith is what we're really going to need to get to? And then we're going to cover also the sword of the spirit. And I have a big sword I'm going to bring out so nobody freak out. I'm letting you know ahead of time. I remember years ago when my kids were little, we had a guy come named Eric Pryor. And for you that don't know who he was, he, he was actually the priest of the satanic church in San Francisco at one time. Well, I was going to tell the other part. And he got saved at a Larry Lee. We had been to a Larry Lee thing down in Southern, well, down in San Francisco at Candlestick. And he came forward and got saved that night. Larry Lee and Dick Burnell had been working on him for a number of weeks because they were doing this in San Francisco. So they were meeting with the leaders and he came to curse them. Instead, they blessed him. That's right. That's right. Amen. And he used to wear all black. Virginia might remember this. He wore all black. He had his hair dyed black, all this stuff. When he came, he talked about this very armor of God. And I remember he brought out a sword. I mean, it wasn't like the sword I have. It's a Roman sword. It was a, like a Viking sword, a big, long, wide sword. And one of my kids went, oh, my gosh, he's backslidden. <laughs> but what it was was he was making an illustration and as far as I know he still serves the Lord to this day That's right. so don't fear don't fear what comes into your church don't fear what tries to come into your home keep it out in the name of Jesus you have control over that amen That's right. and so know the power know the anointing of that stay in harmony because harmony is where two, where two agree together touching anything Look at the power that would be. There's maybe about 100 people in here this morning. I know we're down with everybody running around for the summer. But listen to me very carefully. It's amazing to me that people don't realize they have the right to bind and loose. When after he said, the gates of hell will not pray, he said, I give you the power, the right, the authority to bind and loose. You will let things into your life or keep things out. And he says, I give you what? The keys. Yeah. Everybody say keys. keys. Now how many of you know keys are another key thing to God? Keys are even in heaven. That's right. yes. According to Revelations, there are keys there. And keys have always been to open, to lock, or unlock. That's right. Come on. I mean, and what good do your keys do you if they're in your pot? Well, I can't even say that anymore. <laughs> I never thought of that. I started to say, what good would they do if they were in your pocket and you were in your car? But now you don't have to have a key to start your car. The newer ones. I know some of us don't have any of those cars yet. But, <laughs> but really, would your home open because you said, open sesame door? No. 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 What do you do? You put the key in. You turn the lock. That's exactly spiritually what you do because now you're in unity with God and it's not your keys it's his keys I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Amen. do you know what God has for you it is so awesome what God really has for you in life yes.